Hey, in this video, I'm gonna help you pass Security Plus. Hey gang, it's Ron from ITMatchKey.com and my job is to help each and every one of you guys get certified. So if you're watching this video, you're probably trying to get Security Plus certified. So Security Plus is usually the first certification that people that's interested in cybersecurity go after. So hopefully after you watch this video, you feel a lot more confident and you understand what's gonna be on the actual exam and how to actually think when you get inside of the exam room so you can pass the exam on the first try. So if you never did any of these types of practice exams with me, this is how we do it. So I give you a question, I give you the answers, give you a little bit of time to think about it, then we come back as a family and we discuss what the answer is and why that is the answer. Before we get into that, take one brief moment, like this video, subscribe to the channel and share it with anybody who can benefit. Jamal is part of the hacking organization Wolves Inc. He socially engineered the executive assistant at a huge law firm located downtown. He gained access to a room located directly next to a server room. Jamal used a wireless radio frequency to gain unauthorized access to devices within the server room. Which of the following would best prevent this type of attack? Security guards, Faraday cage, router duplication, or none of the above. So a Faraday cage is like a shield. So it stops frequencies and any kind of wireless craziness from going in or going out. So a Faraday cage or a Faraday shield is an enclosure used to block electromagnetic fields. A Faraday shield may be formed by continuous covering of conductive material or in the case of a Faraday cage by mesh or materials that's just like mesh. Faraday cages are named after a scientist, Michael Faraday. He invented the Faraday cage in 1836. A Faraday cage operates because an external electrical field causes electrical charges within the cage's conducting material to be distributed so that they cancel the field's effect in the cage's interior. This phenomenon is used to protect sensitive electronic equipment from external radio frequency interference often during testing or alignment of the device. They are also used to protect people and equipment against actual electrical currents such as lightning strikes and electrostatic discharges since the enclosing cage conducts current around the outside of the enclosed space and none passes through the interior. You are visiting your local bank. This branch requires all users to use two-factor authentication. To use an ATM, you must have a debit card with the PIN. What portion of the CIA triad would this relate to? Confidentiality, integrity, availability, or authentication? So let's talk about confidentiality. If you hear some some roaring in the background or something that's vibrating, that's just because I'm in, you know, I'm in I'm in the fusion. You know, you don't have you don't have one of these. It's about uh, seventeen thousand horsepower. So if you hear some 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 rumbling, that's what it is. So confidentiality just makes sure that the things that are supposed to be secret are kept secret. So the things that are confidential are kept confidential. So the CIA triad is confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Confidentiality is one of the biggest pieces, one of the biggest parts, because if that gets compromised, a lot of times the integrity is going to get compromised and whatever you're trying to get probably won't be available anymore, right? So the confidentiality just make sure that the things that are supposed to be secret are kept secret. The CIA triad is a security model that consists of three vital information security principles. Confidentiality, like I said, making sure that things are secret. Integrity, making sure that 
things are the way that they are and they haven't been manipulated, that nothing has been added, that nothing has been taken out. The integrity is intact. Then last but not least, availability, making sure that things are available when you want them to be available. So if any parts of this triad are compromised, that is a serious issue. Okay, so the CIA triad. In the comments, actually drop an example that you have of the CIA triad, whether it's confidentiality, integrity, or availability. Give me a real world example of one of those. <clears throat> this model is widely used by organizations to implement appropriate security controls and policies, which helps identify key problem areas and the necessary solutions to resolve these issues. You currently are doing risk management for a 50,000 square foot warehouse. The owner of the warehouse consults with you about the best insurance coverage available in case the warehouse is damaged. What is he doing in regards to risk? Transporting, transferring, avoidance, mitigation. So when we talk about risks, there's a couple different ways that we can actually deal with it. We can mitigate a risk, we can transfer a risk, or we can absolutely avoid a risk. Now, to avoid me busting my chin open, I'm gonna stop and explain what the hell I'm talking about. When it comes to risk in cybersecurity and just in general, there's a couple of different ways to deal with it. Now, there's some risks that you cannot avoid. Thunderstorms, earthquakes. If you live somewhere that has those type of things going on, you wouldn't be able to avoid those things. So you can mitigate certain things by lowering your risk. So mitigation, simply put, is just trying to lower your risk. And mitigation also includes trying to reduce the impact of whatever that risk is. And last but not least is transferring the risk. So in this scenario, that's what happened. The risk got transferred. So with insurance, you transfer the risk. Hold on, listen to the birds. Can you hear them? I'm up early, man. I'm up early doing this for y'all. But anyway, transferring the risk takes the burden off of you and puts it onto a third party. If you have car insurance, right? which I hope you do, you are transferring a risk from yourself in case you get into an accident, in case somebody runs into you. You're transferring a risk to the insurance company. So if something happens, the insurance company would be responsible for that risk. So just understand in IT and on the actual exam, risk management is super important. Risk management is also important in your everyday life. So these skills and the stuff that we're learning inside this actual program, inside this course that you're looking at right now, and inside the actual Security Plus exam can actually be transferred to your real life, right? Risk transference, risk mitigation, and risk avoidance. You need to really hone in on those three things for the exam and for your actual life. So let's dive a little bit deeper into risk and risk management. So risk management usually has a few different steps. So the first thing you're gonna do is identify the risk. So you actually need to know what the risk is. You know what the risk is. So you can do that as an individual or you can do that in a team setting, but you need to identify what the risk actually is. Then after that, you need to analyze the risk. So you got to have risk analysis. So basically when you analyze the risk, you're determining the likelihood that the risk will actually occur. Whether it's on a scale from one to 10, one to 100, A to E, you need to just figure out what's the likelihood of that risk actually happening. Then after that, you need to prioritize the different risks. So not all risks were created equal or have the same level of severity. So you need to prioritize the risk to see which ones are most most important which ones are most threatening. After that, you need to assign personnel or persons to each risk. So each risk should have an owner. Each risk should have somebody that is directly responsible for that risk. So if you identify and you prioritize, but you don't have somebody dedicated to the actual risk, it's kind of going to mess you up. It's going to be kind of useless, right? So if you're the project manager, whoever you are, everybody should have a risk that they are obligated to be responsible for. After you've done all that stuff, it's the risk response 
response. So how do we actually respond to the risk? So the project manager or whoever is in charge of everything is probably going to deal with the risk owner in order to decide together as a team which strategy to implement to resolve the risk. So you've done everything, identified it, analyzed it, got the owner, prioritized it. Now you actually say, okay, when this happens, this is how you respond to it. Last but not least is monitoring the risk. Right, so monitoring the risk to see has anything changed, do we need to change our approach, so on and so forth. So whoever the risk owner is gonna be primarily responsible for monitoring that risk. Jerry compiled code for a proprietary software. You provide lots of invalid or random inputs into the software. You're trying to cause crashes, errors, or memory leaks. What type of tests are you performing? Smurf, penetration quiz, fuzzing, linger. So while well, I'm making this delicious smoothie gang, full of nutrients and vitamins so I can grow strong and healthy. Let's talk about fuzzing. F-U, LOL, F-U-Z-Z-I-N-G. Fuzzing means automatic test generation and execution with the goal of finding security vulnerabilities. So fuzzing actually is a way to ensure that Whatever program you got, whatever you're doing, whatever vulnerabilities, whatever shortcomings it has, the main purpose of the test is to make sure that those vulnerabilities are exposed and that they are found. So you can actually have some preventative stuff to help thwart whatever issues may come up and things like that. So generally the fuzzer provides lots of invalid or random inputs into the program. The test, like I said, really tries to cause crashes, errors, memory leaks, and stuff like that. Normally, fuzzing works best on programs that take inputs, like websites that might ask for a name, age, email address, or something like that, okay? Lynn is a network security professional. She is getting an alert from her IPS. She checks out the suspected intrusion and finds nothing wrong. What is Ailey experiencing? False true, false positive, true positive, positive negative. So a false positive usually happens when something that is innocent gets deemed as something that is fraudulent, malicious, or unauthorized. So a lot of times what will happen is the credit card companies, right? This is a good example. The credit card companies will have a false positive when it comes to fraud. Let's say you usually only spend $20 on this card every two weeks. Then out of nowhere, you decide that you're going to spend a thousand dollars right a lot of times that transaction will get denied it'll get rejected because it'll be like, okay this person never spends this amount of money so maybe their card has got stolen maybe the identity got stolen so let's go ahead and deny this transaction and let's trip the fraud alert so that would be a false positive you were just trying to buy some whatever a thousand dollars will buy you these days and the credit card company said this person is usually super frugal how the hell are they spending a thousand dollars out of nowhere and that would be a false positive right something looking like it was for sure positively fraud but it was a false positive it wasn't the actual instance that wasn't wasn't ha what was happening okay now now let's talk about the difference between uh, false positives and false negatives okay so a lot of information security tools often refer to false positives and false negatives it's not necessarily essential to know the difference between these two but i think it's a good idea to know the difference right so a lot of times false positives like i said before is pretty much when something that's cool is deemed not cool so like something that's safe is incorrectly classified as being malicious. Now, a false negative is 
a lot more dangerous because that's when a malicious request is incorrectly deemed as safe. So if a security tool incorrectly identifies something as safe when it's actually malicious, that is called a false negative. The term negative refers to the fact that the tool was looking for something malicious and decided what it looked for and what it looked at was not malicious. Declaring something safe that is actually malicious is therefore considered a false negative and that's no bueno. Again, to keep each other accountable, drop in the comments what certification you're going after and when you plan on having that certification. If you haven't done so yet, go over to itmagickey.com. The link is in the description and go ahead and sign up for the Zero to Hero program where you can get four of the most in-demand certifications in the industry in 90 days. Or you can go ahead and apply for the winner circle. So the winner circle is everything in the Zero to Hero program. Plus, we help you with getting a job. How do we help doing that? By making sure your LinkedIn is buffed up, making sure that you actually have a very, very, very good resume that recruiters and employers will actually look at, that will actually get you an interview, and will actually give you interview tips and help you in your job search. So we'll get you the search and get you a gig. Other than that, I'll see you in class.